It's difficult to grasp the fact that after 12 long years of waiting, we finally have our hands on the first new and original Crash Bandicoot experience in almost two console generations. It just doesn't seem real. The Orange Rat's return to prominence thanks to not one, but two excellent remakes was a long time coming. But from the moment Future Tense in the Insane Trilogy showcased the newfound potential in this franchise thanks to modern game design sensibilities, my excitement was untamable. And then in June of 2020, it was officially announced. Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time. You're damn right it's about time! I was only 12 years old when Mind Over Mutant released, so it has taken half of my existence on this earth for my favourite franchise to finally return with something new. So the only question is, were all of those years spent waiting worth it in the end? Well, it's about time we find out. Quickly before we start, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Mark for the phenomenal job he did on the artwork for this episode. Absolutely stunning work, mate. And I'd also like to thank Activision for allowing me to get my hands on this game early, prior to release, so that I could get a head start working on this review. Thank you very much. Though, I must admit, I am thoroughly disappointed at the lack of a Crash Bandicoot skateboard. Man, that would have been epic. Though, I can't really complain, I guess, because if you'd told 12-year-old Square-Eyed Jack that he'd get to play this game early, definitely would have made a mess. <laughs> Alright, let's get started. It's About Time picks up after the events of Warped, which was an excellent move if you ask me, and gets us right back to that classic Crash formula. Not by dismissing later entries in the series, but by creating a split timeline which opens up the level themes and character story arcs to limitless potential. We join Cortex, Entropy and Uka Uka still trying to break free from their prison of time, and I must say, if they were babies when they arrived here, they're looking damn old and weathered for 22 year olds. But it is something very special to see Tropy positioned as the key antagonist here, outranking Cortex who only wishes he could retire to a nice warm beach. His spirit is broken, but there are still evil deeds to be done. As for our heroes, who I guess have just been laying around this entire time, Crash and Coco must work together across each dimension to secure the four quantum masks and repair the fabric of space and time. Simplistic storytelling at its finest, and now that it's out of the way, let's launch into this beast. Right out of the gate. I don't usually like to give graphics priority over gameplay, but it's the first thing you see, and this game looks bloody fantastic. Holy Holy shit, I'd expect nothing less from Toys for Bob after their work on Spyro Reignited. This game has such a fresh art style for the franchise, so much vibrant colour, each new world is so dense and brimming with detail, set pieces are off the chain, and it's got that absolutely essential feeling of journey. No more of this strictly Sonic's ass gameplay or side-scrolling either. Levels now twist, turn and split across huge environments that constantly evolve around you. We're running around pirate-infested wharfs, through treasure caves and rail grinding above this dock area, we then continue to platform later on. And this is just one example from a single level. I've had a lot of people questioning if I'll be updating my every Crash Bandicoot level ranked list to include Crash 4 now that it's released, but I've got to be honest with you all. Modern knowledge of what makes this formula so fun would be an instant handicap on the rest of the series. That is how superb the level structure is in this game, and the controls meet that same standard. The minute differences are apparent when you first start playing, but it really doesn't take long for everything to just flow and feel so natural, blasting your way through these courses. Big Horn Energy? Yeah, tell me about it. We're playing a new Crash Bandicoot game. What did you expect? When you complete a level, you're graded on your Womp account and Death count, which is neat, along with the traditional box and hidden gems. Gems unlock different outfits for the characters, mostly themed to each different 
different level, but we've also got some funny and weird ones too. Taking inspiration from Crash 1, levels are split across a detailed map screen, which was a good decision in my opinion, as the warp room format would have felt outdated. And what a beautiful map screen. I just can't get over how good this game looks, especially all of the character designs and bouncy animation. Crash is just so damn fuzzy and cute, I could hug him all day long, and I can't say that I've ever seen him so full of energy. Every time he's on screen, I can't help but laugh or just sit with a big stupid grin on my face watching his shenanigans. But back to gameplay, we've got our double jump right from the very beginning, which is welcome, next to Crash's core moveset, but the real talking point here is all of the new abilities. The Bandicoots can now walk run which is so much fun, adding a new layer to the platforming challenge, still having to break crates and avoid hazards in unison. We've got rope swings which call back to Crash's original inspiration from Rare's Donkey Kong Country trilogy, and we can also rail slide and hang down to zipline. Awkward silence for Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, given both of these games seem to have a very similar gimmick, and Ratchet of course, no stranger to gnarly grinds. I'll be honest though, I always groan when I see this in games. I just find it to be a bit boring, literally an on-rails platformer because it plays like a quick time event that gets repetitive if you fail. But here, I actually find this so much more engaging than normal thanks to how much is going on in these segments most of the time. And that's something we'll get to later on. The difficulty here is noticeable right from the very start. The first area is a desert wasteland, a la Mega Mix Mania, that was added into CTR earlier in the year as we work our way towards Engine. Yes, that's right, no lame Papu Papu or Ripper Roo for baby's first boss fight, no, we start the game with Engine. That's something I love with the story here. We have so many top level villains in the mix that there is no room for henchmen, and as a result, who would have guessed this is the best first boss fight of the entire franchise? Behind Cortex and Mecha Bandicoot into insanity, of course. <laughs> Jamming out to awesome tunes, dodging attacks and taking our shots. Though I've got conflicted feelings over the checkpoints in boss battles present here. On one hand, it prevents getting stuck and potentially not enjoying the game, but it does also drastically reduce the difficulty, which, I'll admit, can be a nice change of pace. The general format here is defeat a boss, hunt down a mask in the next area, then rinse and repeat. So let's talk about these quantum masks. Lanny Loli is the first one we meet and has some real anxious chaotic energy. Once we meet a new mask, they will appear in specific locations within levels to grant you a special ability. Lanny here has this phase shifting thing going on where you press the button to turn objects on or off. Everything from boxes, platforms, hazards, walls that block your path. This is such a next level mechanic for these games. An additional element that creates interesting and intuitive platforming challenge whenever it appears. It's great early on, but towards the later stages, this thing gets out of control. Next up is Akano, who gives us an endless tornado spin, which again, serves the primary purpose of switching up how you traverse each level, while also being good in combat scenarios. This was the one ability prior to release that I was under the assumption wouldn't add much to the experience. So, I was very happy to be wrong about that, because these levels are some of my favourite. Kapunawa here was our first glimpse of this game almost one year ago. Damn, that's crazy. She allows us to slow down time for a brief moment to make navigating the new timed crates easier, as well as the ability to bounce off of nitros and other hazards before they explode. Radical. Take that tiptoe from Wrath of Cortex, your worthless ass just got fucking owned by Kapunawa. Having said that, this ability feels the most situational and forced out of all of these. Of course, we only have these powers when they're presented to us within the levels, but the object phasing would work for any scenario. The tornado spin would be effective in every single level if we had the chance to use it. And the final mask, Ika Ika, reverses gravity, and it actually blew my mind how many different ways we have to learn how to manipulate this ability 
ability to get through the most challenging levels of the game. So again, it serves a great purpose, while the time slowing feels the most unnatural here. But honestly people, it's hard to complain when this game is just so damn good. And I think we all knew that it would be, but of course, there is always that little hint of concern. I know that after completing my Skylanders series review earlier in the year, that Toys for Bob was the weak link in that entire franchise by the end. But I am so happy to report that this game has been knocked out of the park, out of this galaxy, and out of this timeline. It's that bloody good. <laughs> Look at the name of this level, Booty Calls. <laughs> Yes, it does. What's she up to? Do you think she's happy? Yes, it certainly does. The quest for booty is over, because not only do we have a full arsenal of new outrageously dynamic abilities, but for the first time since Twinsanity, we've got a team of playable characters. Thanks to split timelines and this game basically pulling a massive Spider-Verse, the previously one-dimensional babe of the franchise, Torna, has had a massive design overhaul. The leading hero in her own timeline, Torna reunites with the Bandicoots with more simple, yet fantastic backstory story that's efficiently executed so that we can get back to playing the game. Her playstyle is more of a fast-paced platformer beat-em-up with quick strikes, ground pounds, mixed in with wall jumping and a grappling hook. Big fan of this gameplay. Dingo Dial also joins the group, and I'd like to point out, for a time-travelling game that goes so far backwards and forwards in time, I absolutely adore that one of the locations takes place a few days ago. We meet Dingo in Mosquito Marsh enjoying the retired life when his diner is demolished and he sets out to get revenge on the bastards. For a bigger fella, he controls exactly how you'd expect him to, and again, I love how this is different, yet still so familiar with his abilities grounded in platforming gameplay. Using his gun to hover over gaps and get an additional boost up, you can also suck crates towards you, including explosive items that can then be fired back at enemies or to clear the way. And finally, after facing Cortex midway through the game, he teams up for some puzzle platforming, using his ray gun to transform enemies into platforms and bouncy trampolines that are then combined with his dash ability for some additional tricky level design. Cortex, in my opinion, was always going to be the weakest of the characters, given his limited movement and, much like Kapunua, with very situational abilities. Aiming the gun can be a little uncomfortable, however it still serves as a nice change of pace. Each of these characters receives an introductory episode and then go on to offer alternate perspectives of certain events within each level, expanding on the calamity of the narrative. These then transition back into the normal stage with a death route variation where everything is more challenging. What a great idea! But overall, I have only one thing to say about these characters. Take fucking notes, all of you other games, because this is how you execute multiple characters in a game like this. They all feel varied and bring different elements to the mix, but they are all grounded in the platforming format. You had no idea we were missing out on such diverse gameplay from alternate playstyles in this series. And not only that, they just have so much personality and backstory to offer through general banter, which might be my absolute most favourite detail about this game. Dingo Dial wishing to go back home to his diner, Cortex singing away to himself, and even pondering why he installed a hairdryer instead of a teleportation ray into his gun. We even get to hear dialogue from the villains as well throughout their stages, like Brio discussing his true motives to overthrow Cortex. That is A-plus level storytelling, and the best part is, you don't need to stop the game with painful exposition, as this is all back background noise while you play through the levels as a cherry on top for the entertainment to be had here. It's at this point I'd like to remind you, just as a little bit of fun trivia, 
that I've only ever given the score of a 9 out of 10 to three games in the history of this channel. Just something to keep in mind as we continue on here. It's an absolute delight to play this game. Nothing is boring, everything progresses you forward, and each piece of the puzzle has just been executed so, so well. And the difficulty... Whoa, boy, does this game kick your ass. It's no secret that beyond the slippery climbs and stormy ascents of the series, as well as those fucking bullshit bridges in the Insane Trilogy, that Dash Dingo has never offered players any major challenge. Maybe when you're a kid, sure, but these were all designed to be beaten by audiences of all ages and skill levels. But then along comes Crash 4 and says, Fuck all of that shit, it's about time these pussies harden up, because we're doing Stormy Ascent every single level. And I bloody love it. Even in the first area, things are quite testing, but with each new location, you're forced to unlock a new way of using the abilities at our disposal as mechanics are continually combined and frankensteined into some ridiculously challenging levels. The moment you start mixing mask abilities is when shit spikes out of control. And all of these segments are long too. It can quickly grow to be quite overwhelming at times, so reaching the next check Checkpoint is always a true test of your skill, and trial and error is your only chance. Remember, you've got to get all of those boxes. And yes, this is classic Crash BS the way we all love to hate it. I swear it's always one, two, or three missing boxes with me through this entire game. The total counts per level are massive, but if I'm only missing so few every single time, tells me that they went seriously overboard with the hidden crates just out of sight. Whatever happened to having a little trail of Wampa fruit to lead our attention off screen? Thankfully we're afforded three deaths or less to earn another gem, but good luck on those insanely perfect awards for doing the entire level with every box and zero deaths, Crash Bandicoot 1 style. Man, I can spend 45 minutes killing myself and ultimately have to give up on certain box gems in this game. I could not imagine doing these and then continuing with the rest of the level all on a single life. This is pure psychotic torture, and whoever designed this stage, please know that I hate you because this is outright gross and disgusting. I still love it though. But as a result of the extreme difficulty, you've made this game quite inaccessible to the vast majority of consumers, and we haven't even begun to discuss the true extent of how cruel this game can be. Time Trials. I never liked these things growing up with Warped and Wrath of Cortex, but I will admit, the Ensane Trilogy gave me a newfound respect and appreciation for them, and this game ruined it. The times are just ridiculous, hence why gold or better was all you needed in Insane. Here, you need those Platinums, and there is nothing more crushing than finally earning one just to have a Toys for Bob developer time laugh in your face. Big C word. The C word being Crash's flashback tapes. These are an additional collectible that need to be found within a level without dying to unlock these bonus puzzle stages. Set way back when Crash was a mere test subject in Cortex's Twisted Experiments, again, these offer a nice change of pace and a different kind of challenge combined with more amazing banter from Cortex in the background. It appears my old shorts fit the subject splendidly. It's not just clever jokes either. There is so much deep bandicoot lore discussed while you navigate these, and I can't get enough of it. It also makes me very happy that these use nostalgic tunes from the PS1 games and not the remastered versions from the remake. The music in this game overall is very good, very atmospheric and lively, with a lot of familiarity still mixed in there. After defeating Embryo, we also unlock the new Inverted Mode, which is this game's mirror mode, but through a lens of various filters. Thankfully it's not just that, as item positions are sometimes remixed as well, 
but yeah, this is a bit of a letdown for me. I'm fine with having an excuse to play through everything a second time, but the filters just don't interest me. Most of them are purely cosmetic and not in a good way. In fact, they do an excellent job of making these breathtaking visuals look like total dog shit. But I do like the inverted levels that actually play differently. We've got this sonar thing going on, paint splashes that colour the levels while you play, the old timey sped up levels and the slower underwater ones are also good because these actually offer something new in the gameplay realm. But the rest of these are just lame, so it's a bit of a mixed bag. Quite disappointing that each of these different themes are locked to each specific area. But still, I'm just shocked by how much there is to get done in this game. With all of the collectibles, alternate paths, challenging rewards and time trials, it was a good decision to put a restart option at the end of a stage and within the pause menu. But why does it have to load the entire level again? If I'm doing a time trial, which is a no death run smashing crates and just so happen to die right at the very end of a level, it loads everything back to the start instantly. So why when I want to reset after missing a certain gem or whatever else, I have to sit through and painfully wait as the game loads the exact same thing? That alone essentially diminishes all enthusiasm to tackle the massive challenge of full completion. You'd better bloody fix this, guys, or Jack will be mad. So, the game has started to slip a bit, which is something that I noticed at around the halfway mark, as these problems were far more prevalent through the later courses, even though I still really enjoy everything going on here. But do you know what I don't enjoy? Botched vehicle segments. With everything going on here, Toys for Bob really withdrew from including many vehicles in this game, probably because they knew they'd bugger it up like everyone else, which is unfortunately what happened. The first vehicle we encounter is this rollerball cage thing. I do actually like this and the chase is really good, so I would have liked to have seen it again. The jetboard makes a return, and it's alright. We obviously don't get nearly enough time to adjust to its minor differences with the classic controls, but what we have here still gets the job done. But then you reach the level with Polar, and yeah... I cannot wrap my brain around what they've done here. The only way I can describe it is that the left and right movement just does not match the forward momentum, making it really bizarre trying to drive. Even more painful is the thought of box gems on this section. Jesus Christ. I struggle to call it bad because it does work, but it's too different from my muscle memory, sorry. It's even worse when we have to ride this alien dinosaur thingy later on in the game with the same control issues. The game already attempted so much and surprisingly got all of it so unbelievably consistent, but they went a little overboard in the end and it really cost them. I don't want that to take away from the overall package here though, because Crash 4 is still a phenomenal game. However, I need to review this game. This entire game. So for that reason, the next part of this video will be the dedicated spoiler section. And I have a lot to say. So please skip ahead if you haven't played this game yet, because you really should experience this for yourself. Alright, final warning for spoilers. Continue watching at your own risk. Oh god, how could they do this to Entropy? How? We face off against Cortex in the middle of the game, who pleads with Crash after the fight for this constant cycle to be broken, which I thought was a great touch. But then Tropy chimes in to dump Cortex and confirm that he's found a new partner, cementing him as the main villain. It's what fans have wanted to see for such a long time since we got a teaser of it in Entranced on the Game Boy Advance. The entire cast of heroes finally meet face to face inside of Oxide 
Oxide spaceship. Oh, I'm so glad to see Oxide is in this game, but I wish he'd had a more prominent role, and also wasn't spoiled by the trailers. But this is where we meet an alternate female Entropy from Torna's timeline, who is possibly even more evil than our Entropy. This is a whopper cutscene, by the way. I fucking died pissing myself laughing. It was great. But then, already at the end of this area, we move into the fight which begins with this trippy Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart trailer. And, well, just take a look. Whoa. Okay, now let's see it with Coco. Yeah, I can't believe they put that in the game. This fight against the Tropies might be my least favourite in the entire game. I just don't think it's interesting and it's over with very quickly. Then, with next to no fanfare, this amazingly brilliant villain duo is completely jobbed out and we move on. Why did they do this? For starters, the dynamic showcase in that cutscene proves that this could have been so much more than what we got. There is zero build up to Tropy turning on Cortex and getting a new partner. Maybe if we'd had a 30 second glimpse of what Tropy was doing between each area of the game, that would have sold this narrative much better. But then to just drop Fem Tropy so quickly, the new premier villain that was our first leaked glimpse of this game? What a total waste! If there was ever a time to pull the trigger and make a new villain, it was now. But this character will forever be a joke for the rest of time after this. And don't get me wrong here, I do like the direction they ultimately took with this game by having Cortex double cross us and take us back to 1996 for Crash's origin. That was a really cool plot twist, although this platforming section was complete garbage because of the weird momentum. I think we can all agree on that. But the point is, I do really like this storyline. I just feel like we missed out on something truly different here. Even if we'd gone on to have a rematch with the Tropies, they get defeated and then Cortex takes their place, that would have been a lot better. But in the end, the final romp through Cortex Castle was next level difficult, but still so much fun. And the final boss was also really well handled, if a little too easy. But it's still definitely one of the best in the series history. Crash 2's final boss is a close second. People were concerned that the split timeline gimmick was going to retcon the other sequels, but it was ultimately this ending that I feel made an attempt at that. It's a bit silly after all of these years to suddenly try and explain why Crash was rejected by the Evolvo Ray, but with that said, it's not important. I still got a laugh out of this, and it's still significantly better than the Ferrets Are God ending of Jack 3. So, all in all, despite my serious hang-ups with how the late narrative was handled, wasting Crash's best villains to date, it was still an excellent end to an excellent game. But seeing what lies at the end of 100 and 106% completion is really not worth it. So I think I'll save myself the agony of even attempting it. Presentation, graphics, level design, character evolution, and modern sensibilities skyrocket this game to success as the true return for Willy the Wombat. You can even play this game with your friends in some fun competitive modes. If you have friends, or you can play this mode alone like me if you're sad and pathetic enough. While it needs a patch to improve load times and hopefully even remove them from the restart level function, as well as a few other quality of life fixes, the only major issue I see here is the difficulty. It's tough, but it's the good kind of tough that makes you want to keep playing. 
Though I will say that the endless horde of collectibles just out of reach is a turn off for me, and I know it's the case for many others. Much like the fan service in CTR Nitro Fueled, this is a game for the dedicated, patient Crash Bandicoot fans from back in the day. It makes this game somewhat uninviting for new players, but I just hope that after enjoying the Insane Trilogy, a new generation of diehard fans will enjoy this game as much as I did. To end off, we see an amazing tribute to the original Aku Aku, Mel Winkler, and as the credits roll, personality continues to ooze out of this game with some great dialogue. Alright, which one of you sick bastards designed this part of the game? Because it was fucking excellent, and you should all be very proud. Even though I hate you. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is without question one of the best games of the entire franchise, possibly even THE best game. Please pardon my inability to just fucking admit it, my nostalgia is holding me back because it feels like sacrilege to even consider a Crash Bandicoot game that's better than either Cortex Strikes Back or Warped, but it is very true. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is the best Crash Bandicoot game, in my opinion. In what has been one of the absolute worst years in modern history, this game is a shining beacon and an overwhelmingly positive distraction, and I just cannot wait to see what the future holds for our favourite orange marsupial. Crash 4 It's About Time gets a well-deserved 8 out of 10. Toys for Bob, you've done it again. I'd like to thank you all so much for tuning in and supporting the channel as we have covered everything Crash Bandicoot over the years, because this really feels like a reward for all of that hard work. So thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and remember to share with your friends and on social media. I'm Square Eye Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. Thanks for watching. Oh, <laughs>